It is now time for member statements. The member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I rise today to acknowledge and to celebrate the incredible efforts of the Hamilton Naturalist Club. The Hamilton Naturalist Club is celebrating their 100th anniversary. That's uh, 100 years of dedication to the appreciation and to the conservation of our wild plants and, and animals in Hamilton and the surrounding region. One of their, their earliest achievements was the designation of Coots Paradise as a nature preserve in 1927. As a result, generations of Hamiltonians have and will continue to enjoy the beauty of Coots Paradise. The Hamilton Naturalist Club Christmas bird count is a tradition that dates back to 1921. They are true leaders in the protection and conservation of our environment and natural resources. At a time when the government is cutting environmental protections and has no credible plan to address our cri climate crisis, the importance of public education and environmental advocacy is needed now more than ever. Congratulations to the Hamilton Natchez Club in doing that work for over 100 years. Thank you very much. Member statements, the member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In March, the town of Richmond Hill officially became the city of Richmond Hill. Yay! Our amazing community is growing rapidly, and I cannot be prouder of the business community who has helped the communities to grow into where it is now. Other than the Business Achievement Award, the Richmond Hill Innovators of the Year Awards are presented to recognize the innovative Richmond Hill companies. They are transforming industries and positively contributing to Canadian and the world economies. On October 30th, four outstanding homegrown businesses were awarded this prestigious honour, including Etsby, Opus One Solution, iSign Media Corp, and Amico. I would like to specifically recognise Etsby who I had the chance to tour and meet with, along with my colleague, uh, MPP Michael Parsa. They were recently granted a contract to provide the educational software to the entire country of New Zealand. Wow. Our beautiful city is thriving. With our government building the subway to Richmond Hill, our city will grow even more, making it an even better place to live, work, and raise family. The best is yet to come. I can't wait to see what is next for our city. Hey. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Davenport Diamond Grade Separation Project will see a new raised guideway built over an existing rail line through densely populated areas of my riding namely the Junction Triangle. Our community fought hard to get the former Liberal government to listen and work with us on this project so we, so we would see the benefits of access to the GO line and to see this project benefit the people that live there. But while the Minister of Transportation and the Premier are holding yet another transit-related photo op, people in Davenport are left waiting. They're waiting for answers about why the major public art component commissioned by Metrolinx was quietly scrapped over the summer. They're waiting for a promised community meeting to answer some very basic questions about how the project will affect their neighbourhoods, even while construction is already underway. And as we face the prospect of more dirty diesel trains running through our neighbourhoods, people in Davenport are waiting for the GO electrification that the Liberal government promised will be completed in 2017. Speaker, our community is tired of waiting. Will this government continue the delays and broken promises of the Liberals, or were they going to do the right thing? I'm calling on the Premier, the Minister and Metrolinx to follow through on the planned GO station, deliver the public realm components and electrify our regional rail system for the health of our community and our climate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for York Centre. Thank you, Speaker. November is meant to raise awareness of men's health issues, such as prostate cancer, testicular cancer, and men's health. Being a clean-shaven guy, I previously hesitate to mark November, but this year is different. As some of my colleagues know, on September 27th, 
My paternal grandfather, Vladimir Zev Baber, passed away. Although he was relatively elderly, he led a long and healthy life until he was diagnosed with prostate cancer about a year ago. My grandpa raised me together with my grandma for the first nine years of my life. I consider him like a father. He had a difficult year fighting prostate cancer, but I, don't, I won't dwell or remember that. Instead, I'll remember his kindness and generosity, his unwillingness to speak poorly of anyone, his eternal optimism that no matter the challenge, that love for others, and especially love for one's own family, will help anyone to overcome any obstacle. We laid him to rest on the evening of Rosh Hashanah, our favorite Jewish holiday. He is me, and I am him, and, I'll, and he'll live with me forever. Since he would probably say enough by now, chin up, Roman, I'll try to articulate a positive message. Some of us guys, we, we don't take health too seriously. Whatever it is, we typically try to walk it off for weeks. We don't have time to see a doctor. So this year, in memory of my grandfather, and to call awareness to men's health, I'm going to try and not shave until December. Life is precious. All of us are precious, and we're precious to the ones that love us. So take care of yourselves. May his memory be a blessing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member of St. Catharines. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, as the critic of veterans, legions, and military affairs, it is an honour to speak about the importance of remembrance. Every year, on the 11th day, the 11th hour, and the 11th month, we stand together and honour those who have fallen. The sacrifices of fallen men and women can never be matched. But in a single moment of silence, we do our best to acknowledge the courage of those who have fallen and those who still serve our great country, Canada. As longtime Legion member, a mother of a son in the Canadian services, I understand the significance of the poppy in how it sends a special message. Unites Canadians for a single purpose, remembering those who have come before us. Tens of millions of Canadians wear a poppy as a pledge to honour our, our nation's veterans. I want to have a big shout out this afternoon to the Royal Canadian Legions, Branch 24, 138, 350, and 418 in my riding of St. Catharines for continually pledging support of Canada's veterans on a daily basis. To all legions, because of our legions, millions of dollars are raised and dispersed to veterans and families for every single year. Last but not least, Mr. Speaker, I want to wish a longtime Meriton Legion member, a friend, a veteran, and a local hero, Ernie Adams, happy 93rd birthday. We greatly thank you for all of your service you've done, Ernie. Happy birthday. Member statements. The member for Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, over the last two months, I've engaged residents of Lanark, Frontenac, and Kingston in a broadband internet survey. Multiple qu questions allowed them to identify what their upload and download speed is, what they pay for their internet service, who they are getting their service from, and their level of satisfaction. Here's what we've heard back. Over 1,300 people have responded and over 93% are not getting the minimum speeds mandated by the federal government. More than half are paying between $150 and $300 per month. Almost half no longer have a landline and rely solely on voice over internet or cell phones. Over a quarter of those residents run their businesses or work from home, making broadband a necessity. Speaker, the survey tells us that the more rural you are, the less you get and the more you're going to pay for it. Even at this high cost, over 98% of residents have internet. It is clear that broadband is a necessity. The government has made a commitment to improve broadband in rural Ontario, but for this to happen, Hydro One 
must be more efficient and permit fiber optic cables on their poles, which will allow rural Ontario to be truly open for business. Thank you. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am proud to stand today and speak about our government leading measures to end hallway medicine. I'm happy to say that to date, our government has allocated almost 8,000 new long-term care beds, which has fulfilled more than 50% of our five years plan commitment. Mr. Speaker, our government is setting up a president. There were, there were no conversation about how to improve our health care system and how we can tackle this long waiting hours before this government. In Mississauga, there have been a location of 457 new beds and redevelopment of 275 upgraded beds in Mississauga Erin Mills. Trillium Health and a new project by the Mississauga Seniors Care Partnership Project. Mr. Speaker, we are standing up for our public health care. We have invested $1.2 billion more than the previous government. Mr. Speaker, we are fast and swift in making this great and needed changes because it's, it takes time to see the effects. We can't wait any longer after 15 years of liberal mismanagement that is supported almost every time by the NDP. We need a solution that will work for longer term. We are creating an environment and a plan for the people of Ontario to grow and prosper while protecting what matters the most. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member Statements, Member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Um, as a proud SICK, it is an honour to rise here today and uh, to discuss uh, that uh, we were out celebrating in the riding of Brampton along with our SICK brothers and sisters this weekend uh, at a tree planting, where along with Council, um, EcoSick and Calsa Aid, the community planted over 550 trees to celebrate the birth of Guru Nanak Devji and give back to Mother Earth. November is also a time of deep reflection for Sikhs as we mark the start of the Sikh genocide in 1984, where the government initiated systematic and cruel human rights abuses against Sikhs in India. As we mark this solemn occasion in our history where so many of us were killed for practicing our faith, it was a powerful and inspiring sight to see the vibrant Sikh diaspora community thriving and contributing to our local community here in Brampton. It was a beautiful reminder that they may have tried to bury us, but in fact, we were seeds. And so we'll continue to grow and be guided by our faith, and we will continue to flourish and rise and lift others up so that we all can thrive. Despite the trauma that our community has experienced, the Sikh community continues to demonstrate its resilience around the world. We have turned our injustices into a quest for social justice for all. Our inherent understanding of selfless serva, the principle of seva, for humanity and our unwavering determination to ensure that all human beings are regarded as one, has shaped who we are as a people, but also, more importantly, how we engage with the world. <clears throat> we see these values exemplified through the work of organizations such as the Ontario Gurdwara Committee, the Ontario Six and Gurdwara Council, the World Sick Organization, the Six Seva Society, Seva Food Bank, and the United Six, just to name a few speakers. While we celebrate and reflect, let's continue to share these values with the world while we work towards peace, oneness, and equality for all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Member Statements, the member for Haldeman Norfolk. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, many of us yesterday met with uh, members of Ontario's fur industry. There's over 10,000 people work in this remarkable Ontario heritage industry. They work as trappers, small family-run farms, as designers, skilled craftspeople, and retail furriers. Ontario is now the largest producer of wild and farm-raised furs in Canada, supporting livelihoods and cultures in rural and remote regions, including First Nations communities. Licensed trappers play an important role in managing wildlife, promoting healthy and stable fur bear populations, while protecting property, habitat, and human health. Ontario is now home to the only two international fur auction facilities in North America, attracting hundreds of buyers from around the world and generating 
more than $300 million in exports. Fur has deep roots in our history, but it makes more sense now than ever before. It's renewable, natural, and is sustainably produced, long-lasting, recyclable, and after many decades of use, it's completely biodegradable. So I, I hope uh, everyone who did take the opportunity to attend the Queen's Park meetings with these talented and hardworking men and women in our Ontario fur industry left with an understanding of the role that they play, a very significant role in this province. Thank you. Thank you very much. Member Statements, the member from Mississauga East Cooksville. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to share with the House some great news in our province. As our government continues to cut expense and unnecessary red tape for businesses and taxpayers across Ontario. As hardworking business owners can tell you, the regulatory knot that has been stifling businesses wasn't tied overnight. It morphed and evolved over many years. Untying it carefully and effectively will take time and persistence, and we are going to do the work needed to get the job done right. I congratulate Associate Minister Prameet Sarkaria, who officially launched a new website on October 18. The site will provide a simple, straightforward way for businesses to contact the government with their regulatory concerns. Businesses are invited to submit their ideas on modernizing regulations and reducing red tape. Through this new website, businesses can tell our government directly how we can make Ontario work smarter for them to help make them to be more competitive, support greater investment, and create new jobs. Mr. Speaker, our Open for Business Action Plan has set a target of saving businesses $400 million annually by 2020. Action like these have helped our talented and dedicated business owners create 272,000 jobs since June of 2018. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. That concludes the time we have available for member statements this afternoon.